Is Kyle Dubas going to be the next general manager of the Pittsburgh Penguins? Is he in Pittsburgh? What is the status of what's going on there? And also, what about that massive bombshell report from Josh Hilly and Rob Rossi? That's all coming up right after this. Your Locked On Penguins. Your daily podcast on the Pittsburgh Penguins. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Your team every day. Hello and welcome back to another edition of the Locked On Penguins podcast. I am your host, Hunter Hodes. Remember to follow me on Twitter at Hunter Hodes. Follow the show's Twitter at LA Marshall Penguins. And of course, thank you all so much for making this your first listen today. We are free and available on all platforms as what a day it has been in this city with a bunch of reports, rumors swirling. So let's just get right on into it. We'll start with not the report from Rossi and Yoey. That will come a little later, but with what is the latest with Kyle Dubas. So I woke up this morning about what, 8 30, 9 o'clock, saw that Taylor posted her story right before 2 a.m. local time here in Pittsburgh. And Haas of DK Pittsburgh Sports, she is reporting that Kyle Dubas was at the facility late last night. The meeting carried potentially over in the morning, and Sidney Crosby was there with him. I'm sure just giving him a tour of the place, talking to him, and all that. So Kyle Dubas is here. I mean, I don't need that. I don't need to confirm that for anyone. He, he is here, and he is touring the facilities and getting to know the Penguins and seeing if this is a good fit for him. Well, there's been no announcement so far. I swear it's going to happen when I am recording this right now. I'm recording this what at what? 4.30, 5 o'clock on Wednesday afternoon. It would be my luck to finish up this recording, go check social media, and the announcement for whether or not whether or whether he is or whether he is not the GM will have been made. And it is just gonna throw this episode into the crapper. Um, hopefully, of course, that does not happen. I've heard a couple whispers about a couple things. You know, one I'm not really going to get into, but uh, I can confirm that money is not going to be an issue. Power is not going to be an issue here. The only thing that he really needs to think about is whether he wants to bring his family down. That is the big thing here. Fenway Sports Group, you know, everyone knows they are a very rich company. They will give Kyle Dubas whatever the hell he wants. He will name his price. They will match it. That's just how it's going to be. He is FSG's number one choice, according to Elliot Friedman. He said there had already been discussions last night. He said on the podcast that he couldn't confirm if he was in Pittsburgh, but Taylor and Rob, both from different outlets, have said that he is here. And again, it's all going to come down to whether or not he and his family want to move down here, or if they want to take a year off, maybe just live up in Toronto, Ottawa area. I know he's from Ottawa. Just live up in Canada him not work as much. And then when he sees the right opening, he goes for it. You know, he could also try to spite Brendan Shanahan and the Maple Leafs by taking this job, thinking that it's obviously a big challenge, which it is. You know, this job does not come without its many challenges. I can see it going either way. Right now, I am leaning toward him taking the job, but I will very much not be surprised if he does not take it. It sounds like the finalists, according to Chris Mack, he works for 93.7 The Fan, he said it sounded to Kyle Dubas, Steve Greeley, and Matthew Darsh. And as I said in my Tuesday episode, if Dubas walks away and he says no to this opportunity, I do think that he will give the gig to Matthew Darsh. As for a timeline, again, I've been saying this week is the hope, but they're giving him some time. You, you can't rush a decision like this, especially when people's you know, jobs up in Canada are on the line, you know, the, the families, you know, that's on the line. That's a big move. I know it's not like this six to seven hour drive, but you're still, you're uprooting your whole family coming from Toronto where you have worked in that organization for almost a decade and you're coming down to an area where you don't really know much about it and you're going to be given a mandate to win while at the end of the big three. So I can understand and sympathize why this is going to be a very tough decision for Dubas. Again, Money and power are not going to be an issue here. He will be given total control of the hockey ops. That's not a secret. 
Fenway will give him whatever he wants. He's their top option. That is not a secret. It is all going to come down to whether or not he and his family want to move down here. That last point, you know, I was told earlier today, that's been the main sticking point with what's been going on. So again, timeline, I think they want to know some point this way. I'm sure as soon as possible. I mean, he's here right now. He's probably getting asked questions by Fenway Sports Group and, and returning. He's probably asking questions about, you know, the city, team, all that good stuff. Honestly, if you want to think about this, the Penguins are interviewing him, but he's also interviewing them in return, getting to know the players, getting to know the organization, getting to know the people who work for the organization, seeing the facilities, seeing the arena, all this other good stuff. Meeting Cindy Crosby. That's what it comes down to here. And, And if he thinks the opportunity is good and his family is down to move here, then he will take this job. If not, he will take some time off, maybe wait to see if something in Ottawa becomes open or maybe a different job comes open during the season or during um, the end of next season. But the job is in his hands. They have made him an offer. I mean, yeah, I don't, I don't, obviously I don't know the specifics of the offer. I don't think anyone does. But it's quite obvious that they have. It is his job to lose. And we're going to find out here, I think pretty soon, whether or not he wants it. Again, I am leaning toward the fact that he will take it. But will, will I be surprised? And should any of you be surprised if Dubis does not take it? No. No. And chief among reasons why I want him to take this job, not just because I do think he'll be a good fit here, just because feed me the interactions of the Toronto media and the Toronto Maple Leafs fans directly into my veins. Please, God, give me that. The takes on social media will be unbelievable. Kyle, you lied to us. How could you do this? Blah, 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 blah. It is going to, uh, it, it will melt Twitter. It is going to be amazing if he takes a job in seeing how the fine folks up in Toronto react to it. And I do think it's different for him right now because yes, he did say it's Toronto or nothing, but, but that was also before he got fired by Brandon Shanahan. He was fired people. It looked like the extension was on the one or two yard line. Elliot Freeman made this reference in his blog last night. And I loved it. You, all you got to do is give the ball to Marshawn Lynch and they passed it and it was intercepted. That's, that, that's basically what happened. So I can totally see him saying, you know what? Screw what I said. I don't care what people are going to say. I'm going to take this job and I'm going to do the best I can to run this team. And oh yeah, maybe I'll spike the Maple Leafs a little bit along the way. So that is where it stands right now. Again, I've heard a couple of other whispers. I'm not going to share them right now just because I don't want to be made to look like an idiot. I'm going to keep them to myself. And if he does get the job, I will likely share what those are. But right now, I've heard a couple of things. I can't get it fully confirmed by other people closer to the team. So that's why I'm just going to keep them directly to myself. But I was able to tell you a couple of things that I had heard individually. So we are going to play the waiting game here. What is going to happen when it comes to Dubas? Well, we will see. Again, I lean towards the fact that he's going to take it but I won't be surprised if he does. So that's the latest update on the GM search, specifically Kyle Dubas. Coming up in the second segment, we're going to touch on that massive bombshell of an article from Rob Roski and Josh Haley and how Ron Hextall, Chris Pryor, and Brian Brooke couldn't look, look any worse, even if they tried. So that's coming up right after this. But before we get into that, for a championship team, it's all about making sure every player is a perfect fit. It's the same when it comes to your vehicle. Every part needs to fit just right. So the next time you need parts and accessories, head to eBay Motors. With eBay Guaranteed Fit, you can be sure every part you need fits right the first time around. Just add your ride to my garage and look for the green check to know the part will fit or you will get your money back. Because just like in sports, confidence is the name of the game when you shop on eBay Motors. And with over 122 million parts to choose from, you'll be back in the game in no time. After all, it's easy to bring home a win when the right parts are guaranteed. Get the right parts, the right fit, and the right prices on ebaymotors.com. Let's ride. 
eBay guaranteed fit only available to U.S. customers, eligible items only, exclusions apply. All right, we're back in this episode of the Locked On Penguins podcast. I am your host, Hunter Hodes. Remember to follow me on Twitter, Hunter Hodes. Follow the show's Twitter at Eleanor Store Penguins. And of course, thank you all so much for making this your first listen of the day. We are free and available on all platforms. If you have not had the chance to read Rossi and Yoey's article on The Athletic, please do so. Even if you are not subscribed, you can, I believe you only have to pay $2 to read the article. That's chump change. Please go ahead and read it. There is so much to discuss when it comes to this article. My number one takeaway from this was that while Burke and Hextall were villains here, the true mastermind behind this, the Emperor Palpatine, if you will, who was just, you know, using his little fingers to electrocute and all that stuff. I'm just going to keep using these Star Wars references because I, I love the franchise, was David Morehouse. He was the one who set the wheels in motion to hire Ron Hextall. He was also the one to set the wheels in motion to potentially move on from the big three as Rossi and Yoey right here. Morgan House was scrambling to find GM candidates and was surprised to discover most of his top choices were not too interested in running the Penguins for one big reason. Morehouse sought a willingness from the next heads of hockey in Pittsburgh to break up the big three. Hackstall was up for the job, and Burke came on board to sweet talk sponsors and season ticket holders to distract from management's agreed upon plan for a future without Malkin and Latang. And that is why you saw Malkin last summer. Almost go to free agency because he was getting hardballed by Ron Hextall and Brian Burke. You saw Burke had some weird comments uh, to, about Malkin to the media saying, that like, well, you know, there's an offer on the table, take it or leave it, all that stuff. Rossi also, Rossi and Yoey also write late in the article that Hextall said to Chris Pryor, that's how, we, that's how you negotiate a deal on your terms. It's like, wow. Just a complete gong show by everyone involved. But again, do not. Think for a second, the mastermind of this is David Morehouse. What a complete and utter buffoon. I don't even know how he had this say. I don't understand he was the team president, but he has no background in hockey. Before he got this job, I mean, he was into politics. Yes, for people that do not know, he really did not come from a big hockey background. He was doing stuff politically. And he's going to come in here and say, and be the president and be like, well, I want the next regime to break up the big three, three players who everyone has loved rooting for and who sell his tickets and has brought in this team, Stanley Cup after Stanley Cup. It's like, that's what you're looking for in a new regime? And, and it's no wonder why a lot of the people, maybe someone like Chris McFarland, who was a, a big candidate for this job, passed on it or was, it wasn't given the job because Morehouse wanted basically a yes man to do what he wanted, which was to break up the big three. And apparently, according to Rossi and Yoey, that's when the Fenway Sports Groups stepped in because they heard about the plan and they're like, no, 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 that's not going to work here. We want them to retire as Penguins. You saw Latang get his deal done. And then at the 11th hour, Crosby, Sullivan, Latang, you know, Malkin's agent, they were all able to calm him down and they were all able to get that deal done. But Hextall and Burke were prepared to let him walk. And that's the thing that just doesn't make any sense. How were you brought in here to move on from the big three? What was your plan if they were going to walk? Malkin Latang, that is. Were you just going to sign John Klingberg, who did not have a good season? Were you going to sign Vince Trocek, who is a fine second line center? But he's not Evgeny Malkin. He wasn't even close to a point per game this season. And his contract is ridiculous. What exactly was their plan? If you want to get bad quicker, then okay. But I just don't know what their plan was. I don't know what David Morehouse was thinking. That is by far my biggest takeaway. What a complete and utter idiot he was. And I'm glad he's not with the organization anymore. Feel bad for the Steelers that he's there. He's probably not going to have too much roster decision making. I think he's working in a different department. But that is absolutely ridiculous to me. Another major takeaway from this article. So Fenway, they were they were asking David Morehouse and Ron Hextall and that regime to show them their plans for the team. And this comes courtesy of the article where Rossi and Yoey write, the executives of Fenway, they asked to see Morehouse's and Hextall's plans for the business and hockey departments, respectively, this came last year. 
Morehouse detail, team finances, and waning ticket revenue in a PowerPoint presentation. The hex doll was caught, caught off guard by the request and said the hockey plan was in his head. Remember, Rossi and Yoey had this last year. There's more information, though. He was ordered to put it on paper. He scrambled that afternoon, handwriting his ideas on a legal notepad, transferred them to a Word document, and printing out a couple of pages in a hotel business office. What the heck are we doing here? How are you not fired on the spot for that? I, I understand you can be caught off guard a little bit, but these are your bosses. You can't be caught off guard like that. I understand, you know, maybe Fenway was, you know, just trying to get to know hockey a little bit. They didn't, they maybe weren't fully in it 110%. They are now for sure. They're doing a really good search here, but that is just crazy to me how he is not fired there. What a complete and utter bozo saying like, Oh, I got it all in my head and you can get away with that at your position. Just unbelievable when it comes to that. It's, it's basically just like that meme on Twitter. Hey, can you tell me what your plan is? Oh, dude, trust me, bro. I got it. I got it, bro. Yeah, that's what it is. Oh, I just, un, unbelievable. Though That was the second main takeaway that I had when it comes to that. And you, know, you, you can go down the list when... It comes to the Mikhail Gramlin trade, how Mike Sullivan and Ron Hextall never saw eye to eye. That was very evident throughout this article. You know, Sullivan said he wanted numerous times to trade, to have Hextall, excuse me, trade for some players. But Hextall was like, no, no, man, I'm going to stick this out. This team's going to figure it out. Nope, it didn't. Didn't come close to figuring it out. Another one that really caught my eye, apparently when Hextall put Kisbury Kappen on waivers, According to both Yoey and Rossi, Hextall said privately, oh, he's going to flourish away from Mike Sullivan because he doesn't use him enough. My brother in Christ, Kasperi Kappen was giving ample opportunities. And I mean ample opportunities to succeed on this team. He never took advantage of it. Even during that 2021 season where he was decent, he only had 11 goals in 40 games. By the way, Hextall was talking, you'd think he was scoring a goal per game or even half a goal per game. That's not accurate. So I don't know where that came from. Yes, I get it. He played well down the stretch with the Blues. That's not going to continue next season, people. It's not. I mean, we've seen that song and dance plenty of times before. So that that was ridiculous to me. I, and another, another one, this is another one that was so damning, just getting to this part of the article. When interviewing for their jobs for the, in February of 2021, Hextall and Burke had expressed their willingness to break up the big three, as I said. Hextall wasted a little time embracing that idea. He did not try to negotiate extensions with Malkin or Latang during the 2021 offseason. Also, of course, last year, he re-signed Jeff Carter to a two-year extension with the premise being that Carter could assume Malkin's role as the number two center for this upcoming season. How do you even think of that? What goes through your head to think that Jeff Carter in his upper 30s is going to be your number two center for this past season? I mean, is he deranged? I I, I mean, <laughs> I'm just laughing thinking about it. You're telling me you wouldn't even have tried to sign someone? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, those were my main takeaways of the article. If you want one more, it was Teddy Bluger found out he was traded via social media at the team dad's dinner on the dad trip. They were at a steakhouse in Tampa Bay, and Bluger and his dad immediately left. And when Crosby came back to the table, he said to everyone, that's not how we do things in Pittsburgh. That, that's a damning statement. And I'm not going to sit here and criticize Ron for planning that dad trip at the wrong time. I don't think he has anything to do with that. I think whoever planned it in the organization, you know, you did, I will say this, you did a terrible job. <laughs> you, you did a very bad job planning that. But it was not Hextall's fault that the, the dad trip was right around the trade deadline. I will say that, you know, doing that during a team dinner, though, that's a little, 
that's a little messed up for me. But yeah, and not totally his fault, but still, I, I'm a, it's a little uncomfortable to say the least, and you can definitely tell that Sid was really fed up about it. So go read the full article. Those are just my main takeaways from it. I cannot believe they were even here for two years. Two of the worst years, you know, managing-wise, this franchise has ever seen. Hextall will go down as arguably, if not inarguably, the worst general manager in the history of this franchise. That is how bad of a job he did. With that said, Yins, I am tired of talking about it. I would like to move forward. I'll, the only time I'll bring him up is if I'm really joking about something. But I think it's all time for us to move on. There's a new regime coming. Draft is coming. Agency's coming. We have a lot to look forward to for this team. But had to, had to discuss that big bombshell article because, wow, just unbelievable reporting from Rossi and Yoey. Go check it out on The Athletic. If you're not subscribed, you only have to pay a couple of bucks. And there's a whole lot more in that article that I really did not discuss. So that does it for this second segment. Coming up to end the show, we're going to continue our season reviews with Jan Ruda, how he did, what I expect from him next season if he's on the team. Do I still think that deal that he signed was fair? All that is coming up right after this break. But before we get to that, we do have to discuss Bird Dogs. Are you tired of sacrificing comfort for style when it comes to active wear? Well, that's why I'm introducing Bird Dogs, the game changer in athletic shorts. Picture this. Premium shorts designed for maximum performance combined with unparalleled comfort. Bird Dogs are here to revolutionize your workout routine with their unique built-in liner. These shorts offer ultimate support and flexibility, ensuring you stay comfortable during the most intense workouts. And here's the best part. They are more than just workout gear. They're versatile enough to take you from the gym to the street without even skipping a beat. Designed with pockets that actually work, they give you ample space to store your essentials while you're on the move. They are also made with premium, breathable fabric that keeps you cool and dry throughout your activities. They're perfect for the trails, the gym, or simply lounging around. Bird dogs are the shorts you have been searching for. Order your or order your pair of bird dogs today and join the thousands of satisfied customers who have made the switch. Visit birddogs.com slash locked on NHL and enter promo code locked on NHL to get a free custom bird dogs Yeti style tumbler with every order. Bird dogs where style meets comfort and performance meets perfection. Get yours now and unleash your true potential. All right, I'm back in this episode of the Locked On Penguins podcast. I am your host, Hunter Hodes. Remember to follow me on Twitter, Hunter Hodes. Follow the show's Twitter, and Orso Penguins. And of course, thank you all so much for taking the time to listen. We are free and available on all platforms. So Jan Ruda's season review Played 56 games this year, three goals, nine points in those 56 games. Not a whole lot of offense. Most of his goals came in the early stages of the season. He had half as many points as he did last season for Tampa Bay when he had three goals, 18 points in 76 games. Just not a truly good offensive season. But the Penguins are, you know, they're not paying him for his offense. They're paying him for his defensive work. This year, though, his numbers did dip a little bit. In 56 games, 802 minutes at 5-on-5 ice time when he was on the ice, the Penguins had 49% of these shot attempts compared to the previous four seasons with Tampa Bay where his numbers were 50% or higher. When it comes to goals for, goals against, 28 goals for, 32 goals against. He had been well above 500 in those marks with Tampa Bay. Scoring chances, only 48% of those for the Penguins when he was on the ice compared that to 54% for the last season. High danger chances wise, Penguins were on the ice for 50.6% of those, and then 15 high danger goals for 20 high danger goals against for 42.8%. That's the lowest mark of his career. You know, he had been doing, he had been a really good player in terms of that category in Tampa Bay. It is not the case right now. All of his numbers just skyrocketed. He was signed to a three year, $2.75 million per year deal under the last regime, Ron Hextall and Brian Burke. It was a signing that I was okay with at the time because maybe I thought he was a better option than Chad Riedel. But the more I watched him, the more my opinion started to change. So I was like, wait, you just had a similar player like Riedel sitting in the press box who can do exactly what he does. And I know Riedel didn't have the best season. I think Rudo was you know close to as bad, if not just as bad. Maybe you can argue a little worse. But... You know, he signed for two more years, $2.75 million. It's just a luxury I don't think the Penguins needed with looking back on it. They could have just said, hey, Chad, you are our number six defenseman. They were doing that the season before when Cody Ceci was there for a little bit. So I don't know why they could have just said, hey, Chad, you're our number six guy. 
you know, we're confident in you. We have Mark Freeman behind you. We have Ty Smith coming in. That should be good enough with all our defensemen. But nope, Hextall thought it would be prudent to sign Bruno to a three-year deal worth a little under $3 million per. Again, defensively, he's okay, but he's not going to bring you a lot of offense, and that's fine. I don't need my whole back end to have mostly – Offensive players, I think you I think you can live healthy in a world where three of your guys provide a lot of offense. The other three are more defensive-minded defensive. There, there are room for plenty of those on your back end. But I think the Penguins had too many of the latter this past season and not the former because I think in terms of offense, it was mainly Chris Letang that brought it. Brian Dumoulin brought it a little bit towards the end of the season. Marcus Pedersen brought it a little bit more. But Dumoulin has not been known for being an offensive defenseman. He never scores. Patterson is not usually an offensive defenseman either, but he still had a really good year. But for the most part, it was a tie. So in terms of what to do with Ruda, I would like to think he's going to be on the team. If you can find a trade partner for him, I would entertain it. That's almost $3 million off your salary cap. If you can get another team to take the full cap hit, he's a fine third pairing defenseman. I don't think he's going to be a second pairing guy on a cup contender. Maybe he is on a, a middling or a lottery team. I don't think you would need to attach picks to get out of that contract just because his cap hit is not super high. I think you would have to do that with a Jeff Petrie deal. But in terms of Ruda, if you can get out of that deal and you can maybe promote, you know, Ruedel, even though he had a little bit of a rough year this go around, or if you can sign someone for a bit cheaper on the open market, I would look to do that. I'm just not sure he's the true answer here for this third pair. And like the offense that he brought, I thought it was too little. Even his defensive work this year was a bit shoddy. He did miss some time down the stretch, which was very unfortunate. But he did not look like the same player that I saw playing next to Victor Hedman all those minutes down in Tampa Bay with those uh, back-to-back Stanley Cups with the Lightning. You know, maybe you could argue he was gassed a little bit because he had played a lot of hockey. That's, you know, you can definitely argue that, but uh, I, I I also don't think that he was the right fit for the system, and you, you saw that on display this past season. You know, if you, if you can get out of that deal, I would very much look into it. If not, I think he'll be going into the season as your number six defenseman. That's just how I see it. But that'll do it for this episode of the Locked on Penguins podcast and my season review for Jan Ruda. My grade overall... You know, C minus, regular C, just average to a little bit below average. I don't think he was terrible by any means, but he was just kind of there, I, um, I I think, in a way. But, again, that would do it for this episode of the podcast. Really appreciate all of you listening slash watching. I'll be back with another episode for you all on Thursday, and we will see if the Kyle Dubas saga finally comes to an end. The holiday weekend is coming up very fast. And I am sure the Fenway Sports Group will want to get an answer as soon as possible. So again, thank you all so much for tuning in. Really appreciate it. I'll talk with you all again on Thursday.